This lecture will cover two topics. These are internet artifacts and cryptographic hashes. Some of the most useful and sometimes damning evidence that you'll find in digital forensics lies within the internet search patterns and history of users. This type of evidence can sometimes help prosecutors establish intent or motive in cases like financial crimes and in homicide investigations. The second topic, cryptographic hashes, we've already covered in some extent while creating forensic images in lab. Later in the course, we'll cover additional internet-related evidence such as OSINT, or Open Source Intelligence, which helps collect social media evidence from individuals uh, from public-facing platforms such as Instagram or Twitter. According to a survey that was taken in 2021, the six most popular internet browsers were Google Chrome, Safari, which is found on Macintosh machines, Microsoft Edge, formerly known as Internet Explorer, Firefox, Samsung Internet, and Opera. Each of these platforms has their own way of tracking user-related activity. In this lecture, we'll focus on the forensic artifacts that can be found on Chrome and Firefox browsers. Google is by far the most ubiquitous internet search browser that you'll find on the public sector. Google owns a number of public-facing platforms, including YouTube. It would be difficult to traverse the internet without crossing paths with something that in some way isn't associated with Google. I'd like to start off this block of the lecture with a case study that involves Google and forensic analysis. Back in 2009, a Florida man received a first-degree murder conviction for killing his wife. The most damning piece of evidence in the case turned out to be information that was discovered by digital forensic investigators while examining the suspect's computer. Specifically, the evidence included several Google Internet searches, which included several keywords of interest. Among those keywords, uh, these searches or the keyword search information that was found were Florida and divorce, trauma and gunshot, and lyrics from a Guns N' Roses song titled, I used to love her, but I had to kill her. So what you can take away from this case study is that what you search for may come back to haunt you later. Viewing Google Chrome on Internet Data a lot of Google's browsing history and keyword search information is stored in database files in a user's profile. Much of the information is encoded, so only a small portion is readable in clear text in a hex editor. Additional plugins or tools are required to extract necessary information from Google's metadata files. One of the files in which Google's data is stored is a SQLite file. SQLite is a scaled-down database format that's used in Windows to store many different kinds of functions. SQLite files <clears throat> excuse me, are also used in smartphones. One tool that you can get for free on the Internet that will allow you to view these uh, SQLite files is called DB Browser. Uh, just do a simple search on... Uh, your favorite internet browser, and you can find DB Browser and download it and install it for free. Viewing Google Chrome Internet Data One of the benefits of using commercial products like FTK for digital forensic investigations is that they often come pre-installed with a number of plugins and tools to view and decode information that's ordinarily unreadable to users or not using or not viewing it in the context of a computing environment. Even though most Chrome user related data is encoded and stored within SQLite database files, some information is still readable in clear text within a text editor. Google user activity information can be found on the C drive on a Windows machine. 
Specifically, it's buried within the Users folder under one of the existing user profiles on the machine. If we expand a user profile folder, we can get all the user information by navigating to App Data, Local, Google, Chrome, User Data, and then Default. Within the default directory, there are two SQLite files of interest to us. These are the history file and the bookmarks file. This is the master file table record for the bookmarks.sqlite file. As you can see from the MFT data, the entity is a file that is currently in use and its size is 36,134 bytes. If we navigate to the first cluster of the document's actual contents, we can see in clear text some of the user entries for Internet bookmarks. Google Chrome forensic information obtained from the history.sqlite file. Some of the useful information that we can get from this SQLite file are cookies. These are user-related text files that store information meant for later use. Uh, one example of this is going to a website like weather.com and then coming back to it later and then having the website remember the uh, zip code or the city that you had entered into it. Form history is another piece of information that you can get from the history.sqlite file. This lists any websites where a user entered data through a form, such as a social media post or if you purchased something on eBay. Another one is keyword searches. Any keywords that were entered by a user into the Chrome browser to perform a desired search will be saved. Downloads are another one. Any text, you know, image, video, or music file that was downloaded is recorded here, including source website and the directory to where it was downloaded. Another is the uh, URLs that were visited by a user. The database file keeps a running tab of all the places where a user has been. <clears throat> Here's an example of some of the entries in the cookies table from the history.sqlite file. Uh, this is viewed using the DB browser. This is an example of the, uh, the forms table. This is a list of some of the keyword search terms that were entered by the user and then stored. This is a table uh, listing all of the uh, items that were downloaded by the user. And this is a list of URLs visited by a user. So there's a lot of information that you can get from this one uh, history.sqlite file. This next section of the lecture will cover Internet forensic artifacts associated with the Firefox browser. Firefox is not as ubiquitous as Google, however, it's frequently used as a secondary browser on machines. Uh, Kali Linux has a modified version of uh, Firefox that users use. I'd like to start off this section with another relevant case study. Back in 2008, there was a murder trial for a young woman named Casey Anthony, who was accused of murdering her own daughter. Some of the key evidence in the case focused on internet searches using the Firefox browser. Specifically, the keyword searches uh, present on Anthony's computer included how to make chloroform, neck breaking, and death. The request for the uh, computer you know, examination came after traces of chloroform were founded in an automobile trunk where the body of Anthony's daughter was found. I included this slide partially for personal reasons. 
As part of the Case Anthony trial, Detective Kevin Stinger was called on to testify with uh, regards to some of the Firefox records that were found on the prosecution as part of the prosecution's case. Detective Stenger was a digital forensic examiner for the Orange County Sheriff's Office at the time. He was also one of my instructors during my master's program at the University of Central Florida. Here's a list of some of the SQLite files that store useful internet artifacts associated with the Firefox browser. These include places.sqlite, formhistory.sqlite, cookies.sqlite, faveicons.sqlite, and search.json.mosels4. The Firefox uh, user internet files are located on a computer C drive at users, user profile name, app data, roaming, Mozilla Firefox, Profiles, and Specific User Profile. In this directory, there are four SQLite files of interest for us. These are Form History, Cookies, Fave Icons, and Places. Here's the master file table record for the cookies.sqlite file. As you can see, it's a file that is currently in use by the file system. It's 524,288 bytes in size. If we jump to the starting cluster of the cookies.sqlite file, you'll see the header, which is SQLite Format 3. If you scroll down further into the cookies file, you'll notice several SQL statements. This indicates that you'll need a plug-in or a supplementary program of some kind to view the contents of the cookies file. This is why we use DB Browser to view SQLite files. Forensic platforms such as Autopsy and FTK have these types of plugins that are already built into the interface. In this final section of the lecture, we'll cover cryptographic hashes. We've already covered uh, what hashes are in previous lectures. You've also used them when you created forensic image files. This will provide a little more academic background to the subject. There are many kinds of hashes, but we are only going to focus on the ones that we'll be dealing with as forensic investigators. The three most ubiquitous cryptographic hashes that you'll see in the domain of digital forensics are Message Digest 5, or MD5, Secure Hashing Algorithm 1, or SHA-1, and Secure Hashing Algorithm 256, otherwise known as SHA-256. You can recognize these hashes by the number of alphanumeric characters that are used to represent their output. The MD5 hash has 32 characters in its string. SHA-1 has 40 characters, and SHA-256 has 64 alphanumeric characters. So to provide a little more context, now, what exactly is the difference between hashing and encryption? Well, to put it simply, encryption implies a two-way access to data. There is a mathematical key which encodes the data and then decodes it. If the same key is used to encode the data, it's known as symmetric encryption. If a different key is used for encoding and then decoding, it's known as asymmetric encryption. Hashing, on the other hand, implies a one-way encoding of data. An algorithm takes data as input and then provides an encoded output. In this example, the MD5 hash is used to encode the phrase, I like digital forensics. 
The algorithm takes the string of characters as input, then produces a 32-character encoded alphanumeric string as a result. Hashes are extremely sensitive to change. If we take our previous example, I like digital forensics, and we add an exclamation point at the end, the resulting hash is completely different. No matter how small or large the input, the MD5 hash, or all others for that matter, will produce the same size output. This could be something as small as a single semicolon, or something as large as the collected works of George R. R. Martin, or even the entire contents of a hard disk drive. The MD5 hash is considered by some mathematicians to be broken because collisions can be produced or induced under certain circumstances. So what are collisions? Collisions occur when two different inputs result in the same 32-bit output produced by an MD5 algorithm. To be clear, the probability of a collision occurring between two different inputs is 1.47 times 10 to the negative 29th, or a very large number. And to put this into further context, according to findlaw.com, DNA evidence is considered to be 95% accurate. So it's safe to say that an MD5 hash uh, is unique enough to serve as a signature because that's more than 95% uh, accurate. After our most recent lab, you'll recognize this implementation of the MD5 hash, which is produced after FTK Imager has completed its imaging of a hard drive. John the Ripper is a program that comes pre-installed on Kali Linux. It's frequently used in pen testing as a password cracker. It incorporates both password dictionaries as well as brute forcing of passwords. John the Ripper applies two kinds of methods to crack passwords. First, it employs a dictionary attack. In this method, a list of commonly used passwords is stored in a text document, and then they're, they're hashed. This list is then compared to the target password. If there's a match, then the hash password is cracked. The second method is called brute forcing. In this method, John the Ripper will try every single character combination in the character space against a target password. This is often a more unreliable method. As an example, I just tried a seven-letter password in a test. The hash password was all in lowercase, and after 24 hours of attempting with brute forcing, John the Ripper was unable to crack you know, a simple, all lowercase password. Another method of password cracking is called rainbow tables. Rainbow tables are a series of dictionaries of thousands of words that are hashed. In this use case, a password is compared against every word that exists in the tables. To put this into context, some rainbow tables can take up to you know, gigabytes worth of space. Here's an example of what a rainbow table would look like. In order for this method to be attempted, you must first find a location to store all of the rainbow tables and this can consume a very large amount of resources. This concludes the lecture on Internet artifacts and cryptographic hashes.